so welcome to the stage, Mike LaRosa. Thank you. Hello, Nomad Summit. How are we doing today? Woo! Thanks to everyone for coming back. I know the last session, typically in the day, it's a little long. I love the fact that I started at 420. That was fantastic. That's only, that's one of a couple of different references in this. Um, before I get started, I'd like to start with a moment of uh, gratitude. First, gratitude to the entire team that produced this. I don't know if most of you know this, but the leaders only started on this like two and a half weeks ago to help Johnny. So it is phenomenal. So big round of applause because it's not easy to do this, especially when you've got speakers like me that don't get their slides done until 20 minutes ago. Gratitude um, to all of you for coming here, for you digital nomads that are here to connect with others in your community and share. And for those of you that have taken the chance um, and said, I wanna be, I wanna learn, um, thank you for doing so. So uh, my name is Mike LaRosa, and I'm here today to talk about finding accelerated serendipity, motivation, and community. And you're probably thinking, what the hell is that, right? Accelerated serendipity, what? Well, I would like to say it's actually how co-working saved my life. Some of you might be rolling your eyes. What, co-working saved his life? What does that mean? Ugh. Well, you've probably heard a lot about co-working today. It was so exciting to hear some of the other speakers mention how they've uh, learned how they needed to go to co-working spaces to get better Wi-Fi or, or whatnot. So yes, co-working, saved my life. We're talking about co-working spaces all over the globe, like this beautiful one, um, from Bali to Boston, Bermuda to Bansko, Bulgaria. Where's Matthias? That's the second shout out for Bansko today. It's a beautiful space. Um, these workspaces are shattering people's viewpoints on how and where people can work. And it is absolutely fascinating. It's an industry that's growing 200% year over year. Um, this past year, 2017, was the year of the millionth coworker. There are now over a million people working in coworking spaces all over the world. So, who am I? Who is this guy? You're like, I don't understand. What does he do? Well, I'm a recovering event planner. That's me in the front in the silver suit doing a flash mob at the most boring yet most exclusive executive event on the East Coast. Nothing like doing a flash mob for 1,200 CEOs. They really didn't know how to respond to that. Um, event planner because yes, over the past 10 years, I've produced, managed, developed, coordinated over 750 events, exceeded attendance of over 300,000 people, managed multi-million dollar event sponsorships. Uh, but I say recovering because I keep on trying to get out of it. But just like Michael Corleone, as soon as I think I'm out, they bring me back in. That note, little sidebar, because I'm a glutton for punishment and I can't say no to an event, I just agreed to host a digital detox on the island of Florianopolis off the coast of Brazil. It's March 8th through the 18th. The only reason I accepted it was because I had demanded that they give me a free ticket. So someone in this room will be getting a free ticket to join us at Rosemary Dream, a beautiful digital nomad retreat in Brazil. There'll be some instructions at the end of the presentation if you'd like to enter to win. It's a pretty simple social contest and we'll be announcing the winner uh, tonight at the Maya party. So back to the presentation. I'm also a quasi-digital nomad. I say quasi-digital nomad because I do and can work from all over the world, um, but it's more of like a road warrior. I do about 200,000 miles a year. Um, so I wish I could have the ability to hang out in Chiang Mai for a month or two, um, but typically I'm bebopping all over the place and it's all fun and games, you know, three months in uh, until you get caught at Kuala Lumpur Airport and the hotel loses your reservation and you're trading extension cords for some random stranger's uh, carry-on cooler to use as a pillow. Uh, so for those of you that want to be digital nomads, you gotta, Keep in mind that traveling's fun, but it does wear a little bit. Most importantly, I'm a co-workaholic. I am 100% obsessed with co-working. Like, eat, sleep, drink, can't stop, won't stop, don't stop, obsessed with co-working. How obsessed? 
so obsessed, so obsessed that I've been to over 500 spaces in 35 countries since 2013. Uh, beyond just going to the spaces, I've also done an incredibly embarrassing large amount of Facebook Live tours, interviews, and videos all about co-working on the Coworkaholic Facebook page. So obsessed that I've also spoken at co-working conferences and tried to share my passion all over the world, not to mention hosting a double-decker bus full of random strangers on a co-working tour of Sydney. Australia, so obsessed. So your role, oh, so there's another one. So obsessed that after years of struggling to build my own business, I walked away. I walked away from clients like Google, Living Social, the Smithsonian, and even the twin front men, Benji and Joel Madden from Good Charlotte, that random Emo's 90 band. Uh, actually more famous for being the spouses of Cameron Diaz and Nicole Ritchie. I walked away from that just so that I could spend my entire life to researching, supporting, advocating, co-working spaces, and then now developing and consulting them. So what the hell is it that I do? Well, last year I formed a f former con or a formal consulting business called Agora RDM. Is everyone kind of familiar with uh, the term Agora? Comes from ancient Greeks. The Agora was the marketplace. It was where politicians spoke, it's where philosophers taught, it's where people did trade. Co-working spaces, shared workspaces, open spaces that were all working in and around, it's no different than a modern day Agora. So that is really what I do full time. Um, and we're working on some really, really cool projects. Like anyone familiar with Second City? It's a world famous comedy club and training center in Chicago. Um, helped launch the Blues Brothers, uh, Stephen Colbert, Amy Poehler. Um, we launched a co working initiative for them. So it doesn't always have to be a co working space. We took their training center and we designed a co working program. And so it's empty during the day, all the classes happen at night. And so it's not every day that you can say that you get to co work with Tina Fey. Uh, that happened last summer. In October, there's a few of you in this room that were there that were able to join us. We opened the world's first fully integrated co-working space with an internationally branded hotel property. I know that's a long mouthful. I apologize about that. Nest Dubai at the brand new beautiful Trip by Wyndham Dubai. If, has anyone been to a trip hotel before? Uh, a few. Trips, uh, the, the millennial traveler nomad lifestyle brand. Uh, it's the largest hotel in the portfolio, 650 rooms. It's got a beautiful co working space. Day passes are available, so if any of you are flying through Dubai, taking advantage of cheap flights, spend a day or two there, get a day pass, stay at the hotel. It's the only co working space in Dubai that you get a pool, a gym, and a spa with, right? Um, the next project, and the reason why I'm only here for three days, I have to go straight to DC. Our next adventure is that we're putting a co-working space into a power plant of a former US federal penitentiary, which goes to show that there is no end of love for hipsters, uh, reclaimed loft, open brick, uh, redeveloped spaces and gentrification. Uh, so that will be opening in Q3. If you're ever in the DC area, it's about 15 miles south of Washington, DC. So why the heck? You're like, ah, oh, this is a digital nomad conference, and why is everyone talking about co-working? And who's this co-workaholic? Like, what's his, what's his dealio? What's his angle? Well, I'm here because you guys are all digital nomads. You know the future. You're building blockchains. You're mining bitcoins. You're drop shipping hashtag all the things. Right? You are crushing it poolside with your laptop, right? But do you know about co working? Are you working in co working spaces? Show of hands, everyone here who's worked in a co working space. Oh, I love that. All right, show of hands, no judgment. I'm not going to throw you out. Who hasn't worked in a co working space? Oh, good. Okay. I'm sure you're learning a lot. Last, show of hands. Who didn't even know what co-working was before they got here? A few, okay, awesome. That's great. So I am, no, I say that, no, I mean, listen, no, um, the majority of the room, but yeah. 
So I'm not obsessed with co-working because of hip, sexy, cool workspaces with like, you know, totally stereotypical entrepreneurial quotes. That's not why I'm obsessed with it. I'm not obsessed with co-working because there's free-flowing coffee or because the internet's fast or because there's a shitload of outlets everywhere. For anyone who's worked in a cafe, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Fighting for outlets. There's a reason I don't leave home without an eight-foot extension cord with three outlets on the end of it. I'm also not obsessed with co-working spaces because of all the really cool flavored water, although this is the fucking coolest one I've ever seen. Look, the water automatically fills it up. So if anyone's in US pre-clearance at Dublin Airport, you want to go check that out. It's the best. I, I never drank so much water in my entire life. <laughs> I'm obsessed with co-working because it woke me up. It didn't just wake me up. It knocked me in the face drop kicked me across the fucking room. It taught me more than 12 years of private education, seven plus years of flailing through college trying to get an event management degree, and countless hours of therapy. Coworking saved my life because it woke me up and it led me to an awareness that I'm sure many of you have already kind of reached, not to sound too Oprah-y, living your best life, there's some of you that might be going through it right now, and there's some of you who might not even be there yet. And so that's why I'm here today. I'm trying to kind of let you learn from my fuck ups. And I'm so glad I went after Virginia because basically everything Virginia did was amazing, right? Leaving the door open, leaving a job where they'll always want her back, yada, yada, yada. Polar opposite, polar opposite. <laughs> well, my life hasn't always been puppies and rainbows and Fortune 100 clients and business class tickets, or in my case, unicorns and Ferraris. <laughs> it's been pretty rough. So who here has quit a job that they liked? Very much like Virginia, I'm so glad that we got to do our presentation test yesterday. Who here has quit a job they liked? Or a job that they loved, it was awesome. Who here has quit a job that they absolutely hated? Awesome. Who here has quit a phenomenal, awesome, great job to take a horrible, really bad job only to realize days in, they totally fucked up? <laughs> awesome. How many? Stand up, please. Please? Oh, yeah, give them a big round of applause. They're owning their truth. So I can beat you all. You guys did it. I did it. Not once, not twice, th three, three times, three times. Why did I do that? I didn't do it because my life was bad. I did it because worse than bad, my life was fine. My life was fine. It was fucked up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. <laughs> and it led me to start this horrible cycle that actually started when I was a little kid. Now, those of you in the room that know me really, really well, you'll be like, hmm, LaRosa's still a little neurotic, he's still a little emotional, but for being a gay Italian Catholic only child, you know, getting to the first two done before the age of 30, I mean, that's a real accomplishment. So, you know, we're all works in progress, don't judge. It led me to three specific emotions and feelings that I couldn't get myself out of. It left me restless, frustrated, and resentful. And so I'm assuming that being in a room of almost 500 digital nomads or people who want to be digital nomads, people I met yesterday that said, I just quit my job, I booked a ticket to Chiang Mai, I got five months until I gotta figure out what the fuck I gotta do. I'm assuming you can probably maybe connect here, right? Restless because I don't know where my next paycheck's gonna come. I got five months to make this work. How the fuck's that gonna happen? Or I don't know where I'm gonna go next. Or oh, I didn't you know, figure out how to do my visa run properly, so I just got hauled off a plane in Indonesia, and I don't know if I'm ever gonna get out. <laughs> True story. <laughs> Frustrated because owning a business is hard enough, right? Owning a business while you're location independent, even harder. Owning a business when you're location independent and you're in a country where you don't speak the language and you don't know anyone, it's fucking impossible. 
Like, you'll be sitting there and be like, those bitches on Instagram lied. <laughs> and that leads me to the third one, resentment. Because you'll love this photo. We live in a world where we can work from anywhere. We live in a world where there's people in this room I talk to on a daily basis and we're all in all fucking corners of the globe thanks to Facebook Messenger. But because of that, we're also living in a world, and those of us that are in the digital nomad or globetrotter like, sphere, we're living in a news feed, right? I mean, there's now studies that are saying that there's depression amongst people that they get from being obsessed with social media, right? I mean, there's some major issues. I don't know if any of you are keeping track of what's going on back home uh, from the US. There are some issues, right? There's resentment because you're like, oh, I'm not crushing it like the other person's crushing it. Do you know, I don't know if you can find me in this photo. Do you know how people like fucking hated me? They were like, what the, f I was like, yeah, I was working during that trip. It was great, taking conference calls, right? Resentment builds. The problem started way back when when I was a little kid. I was always really impatient. I got things really, really fast, but I only comprehended 85% of them. I would dive in really quick, and I expected everyone else around me to follow ahead, right? I was five, 10, 20 steps ahead. Like, I wanted the promotions faster. I wanted people in my life to be faster. I'd go on a first date, and I left. I was planning a wedding, right? <laughs> I didn't know why I was constantly experiencing this uh, restlessness, frustration, and resentment. And so being a college dropout, I found myself at Starbucks. And now there's nothing wrong with Starbucks. And to this day, I believe that they have the best company culture that a multinational conglomerate possibly could have, right? By the age of 21, I was the youngest store manager in the history of the company, still have that record. And so I was working my way on up. I was crushing it and I loved it until I didn't. Why? Because I got restless, I got frustrated, I got resentful, right? How dare someone who's 15 years older than me get promoted over me being a 21-year-old? I, I was being an idiot. Got into a, a bad kind of relationship, made some bad decisions, and before you know it, strike number one, I quit. I quit and took a job being a store manager at American Eagle. I hate folding my own laundry. Why the hell would I ever want it? Do you know how difficult it is to fold men's jeans? That, pop, that bump pops out. And I was getting criticized and like docked down by, by my district manager because my denim wasn't folded the right way. I was like, fuck this shit. A week out, I was done. <laughs> Thank God Starbucks took me back with open arms, right? <laughs> this time they said, okay, we're gonna take you back, but we're gonna stick it to you a little bit. We're gonna make you a corporate trainer, but we're not just gonna make you a corporate trainer. We're gonna put you in all the problem stores. See, this was in like 2006, 2007, right before the economy got bad. You know the economy's gonna be getting bad when Starbucks starts closing down shitloads of stores, right? And so I had to be the asshole that would come in and tell everyone, oh, your store manager's been embezzling money or you know, making fraudulent time cards. So everything you thought, mm -mm, we gotta retrain you. It was miserable, miserable. And so I quit. But this wasn't strike two, not yet. I quit for the job of a lifetime. I had a friend that forwarded me a Craigslist post for an event planning role for a publication that's a division of Condé Nast. Like, think Devil Wears Prada, the job a, a million girls would want, right? I left food service, where I thought I would be stuck for the rest of my life, and I was now hanging out at the Mandarin, Four Seasons, doing 1,200-person executive summits. It was great. I crushed it. Crushed it. <laughs> Until, I got restless, I got frustrated, I got resentful. Well, strike number two, I quit. And I went to go work for an industry colleague I had met. She had actually been my vendor. I had been her client when I was at the, the business journals. And well, we were much better friends than we were boss employee. And so luckily this time, the business journals really missed me. So they took me back. And this is a pretty good representation. I got a better job. I got better pay. I was making more money than I ever thought I'd ever make in my entire life. I was on a national level, selling multi-million dollar event sponsorships. It was fantastic, but I wanted more, right? 10 months in, I was like, mm -mm, I gotta, uh, gotta get more, gotta get more. So what happened? Everyone? Restless, 
frustrated, resentful. Well, strike number three. This time, it was bad. <laughs> it was real bad. Because I quit to take the worst possible job I could have ever taken. It was with a completely old media company that lied through their teeth about what I'd be able to do and what they wanted me for. And literally two days in, I was like, I'm fucked. So I started trying to scramble, trying to find some contracting gigs. And on two months to the day, April 20th, told you there'd be another reference in there. Um, I walked in, dropped my resignation letter off, dropped my name badge off, dropped my laptop and walked out. It was basically like, fuck you, fuck you, you're cool, gonna miss you, talk to you later, I'm out. <laughs> well, the business journals wouldn't take me back. Starbucks wouldn't take you back. Good Charlotte, that band I got to work with, they have a line, right? You know, if you smoke crack, McDonald's will never take you back, but you can always be the mayor of DC. Yeah, no one wanted me. No one wanted to hire me because I had basically trashed my reputation. I was bouncing all over the place. I was unstable. I was restless. I was frustrated. I was resentful. And so what did I do? I thought, I thought, I said, well, both my parents own their own businesses. I can do it. If they can do it, how hard could it be? <sighs> well, I had no money because I was blowing it when I was making the more Susie Orman says, the more money you make, the more money you spend. So I had to leave my really nice, fancy apartment that was a corner, you know, block, block away from the White House. And I was living in like a half livable English basement apartment. I was trying to become an event planner, but people would only like give me like these little shitty happy hours to work. Everyone wanted me to sell sponsorships, but not pay me, right? Oh, I'll give you a commission if it comes in six, eight months down the road. I didn't know what to do. I was trying to run my business from my home. My father and I are completely different people. I love him to death and I'm so grateful for everything that he gave me, but he showed me a way of working that would never work for me. My father has worked out of his house for 25 years, right? I could barely make it two months. I gained 40 pounds. I would watch all four hours of the Today Show. No one should watch all four hours of the Today Show. I wasn't out networking. I didn't realize how much I needed that community engagement. I didn't know how much I like thrived on working with employees. Well, it got even worse because I was broke. So I sold my car. Oh, I'm gonna get a moped. I'm gonna be hip and cool and save money. Well, two weeks after I got my first legitimate client, boom. Got hit by an 82 year old Sunday driver that didn't think he hit anything and drove off. Lost half my hearing in my right ear. Couldn't really work. Was kind of fucked up. Uh, oh, let's also talk about, you know, the guy I was dating who turned out to be a sociopath con artist who stole my identity off the medical paperwork that was sitting on my kitchen table and trashed my credit. You try being a small business owner trying to get a business credit card when your credit's just been trashed. Yeah, shit sucked. So I didn't know what to do. I was like, I'm gonna have to go home with my parents, I'm gonna go have to work for my father and sell medical point of care testing equipment until someone hired me and said, can you meet me at my office, which was at a co-working space, Washington DC's first co-working space. It opened in 2001. It was called Affinity Lab. It was before the time co-working even existed. It wasn't a term. It was a bunch of fucking Burning Man people. They called it an entrepreneurial dream space. <laughs> the business plan was fucked. They were running out of money. It was a hot mess. But I walked in and I couldn't believe. I was like, oh, wait a minute. I thought co-working spaces were for startups. I thought you had to be like a wannabe unicorn trying to get a billion dollar valuation. <laughs> and what I realized was that everyone that was in this room they cared about me. They talked to me at the coffee machine. They'd be like, oh, I just heard you on the phone. Have you thought about pitching your business like this? They engaged with me like no one would ever engage with any of us in a cafe, right? When a cafe, you're in a public space, you have your headphones on, you don't want anyone to bother you, you don't trust anything, you ask a random stranger, can you watch my laptop while I go pee? At a co-working space, I found accelerated serendipity. 
the idea of when you have multiple people of similar thoughts or similar interests in a space, the magic that can happen. So I went from being broke, not knowing what to be able to do, but knowing I had talent, knowing I could work hard. Someone who sat next to me at the desk next door, I only knew them because we shared Chinese food orders, right, to get the delivery minimum. They overheard me on the phone and they said, Actually, we're a legitimate internet radio station, you know, the number one listened to in the world. Um, our investor wants to talk to you. Can you hop on a Skype call tomorrow? Sure, yeah, hop on the call. It was Benji fucking Madden, Benji Angel. Within three days, I was working for them. They were flying me to LA. We were hanging out at the Soho house. I was like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> I didn't spend a single dollar doing business development. I didn't spend a single dollar going to a marketing networking events. But because they knew me, because they trusted me, because they liked me, they gave me that chance. Took that chance, landed the Smithsonian. Took that chance, landed the, the Google, the big Google. Like, it happened because I was in a space, right? Motivated, I was motivated because I was so broke at the, when I first started going there, I traded out a desk membership to work the front desk. So now I had to get out of my bed every day. I had to walk by the gym to go to the co-working space, right? I had a reason to go. I also knew that if I was sitting at my computer and I was goofing off on Facebook, people would be looking at me, judging me. So I was more productive, right? Accelerated serendipity, motivation, basically community. I was engaged with others and I felt like I was part of something bigger and wanted to help them as much as they wanted to help me. So you're thinking, okay, We've heard your life story. Get on with it. So basically, these are tips, tricks, reasons why you need co-working, et cetera, et cetera. Number one, don't take Wi-Fi outlets or a professional productive space for granted. You're talking to a former Starbucks store manager. They don't want you there for three, four hours when you buy a tall fucking cup of coffee. <laughs> they don't want you there. That's why I'm playing my music so loud. Get Get, the, get, get a clue, right? The Wi-Fi is not always great and it's not private, so, you know, or not secured all the time. Outlets, there's not that many of them. <laughs> that's, that's intentional. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times I've thought, oh, I'm gonna go to this cafe in between meetings because there's not a co-working space, whatever. I'm gonna get so much done. You walk in, the, the milk's screaming because they haven't properly aerated the milk proper, you know, correctly. There's little kids crying. They're playing like some Michael Buble song. <laughs> not good. Next, anyone can Google search for local co-working. The next slide, I promise you, is not a sponsored slide. It's not a professionally paid endorsement affiliate marketing slide. It's the goddamn honest truth. You can Google search co-working spaces or you can just go to coworker.com. <laughs> coworker.com, the best resource for co-working spaces. Before you even think about where you're going, if you think you're going to a city, go on fucking coworker.com. Great reviews, legitimate reviews, not spammy, Yelp, shitty reviews. Also, free day passes. Hello, that's a no-brainer. A free day pass for each space you wanna go to. Next, co-working spaces are more than just fast Wi-Fi, flowing coffee, and plentiful outlets. They're dynamic and engaging communities full of people just like you. Once again, accelerated serendipity, motivation, Community, they provide these three things. Now, I saw an interesting TED talk the other day, and the woman was sharing about how there was a study that uh, researched the impact of different habits on lifespan, right? And so shockingly, the bottom third, like it was like there were like seven main factors. The bottom third or fourth one was like, was losing weight. I'm like, oh, thank God, okay. And then above that was like, no more boozing, uh, no more smoking. Uh. But the top one that had the most impact on lifespan was interaction with other people. We are social beings, we are social animals, we thrive on interaction. So get out of your house and go to a co-working space. You'll never possibly, I can't describe you enough how important it is, just get out, meet new people, go out and explore. So community managers are pretty much the best local guide 
you've ever asked for, right? They do way more than just fill the printer paper. They do way more than just make coffee. They love what they do. They might be a little stressed out. They might be a little underpaid, but they'll tell you anything you wanna know, right? There are some spaces like um, Anchor Hub in Cambodia where their community manager develops this whole like, I want to go to Cambodia. I'd never been to Cambodia before. I didn't know what the fuck I needed to know about Cambodia. They told me this is how you get your visa. This is what you have to pay for. This is what you need to do. There'll be a tut tut that picks you up at the airport with your little name on the sign. They put my SIM card in my phone before the tut tut even left the airport. I had an apartment that they had found for me. $10 a day, private. AC, Wi-Fi, breakfast and lunch included. They had, you know, like whatever I needed to do, they coordinated tours. Community managers, they need to be your new best friend. They'll tell you the events you need to go to, they'll tell you the people you need to avoid, and they'll tell you the best places to get lunch. Now, memberships come in all shapes and sizes, right? So you have to envision that co-working is more than just a desk, right? So I have a personal WeWork membership that's the lowest, 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 like $50 a month, right? It gets me minimal access, but what it does to the space, it gets me into their app, it gets me into their member directory, it gets me into their events. And so it is not crazy to have a couple different memberships in different spaces because there's all different types of spaces out there. There's spaces that are shared kitchens. There's one we worked on in DC that does small business development just for government contracting. There's the um, cultivated synergy co-working space in Denver, Colorado, just for uh, legal marijuana industry businesses, right? So it makes sense to have multiple different memberships. They provide way more value than just the desk and coffee. With that, anything in life you get what you pay for. And that doesn't always mean cash. So even if you are strapped for cash, or even if you can't justify the ROI on paying for a co-working membership, get creative. I mean, I saw my ass on the corner of any street, and so I couldn't afford that Affinity Lab membership, but I worked four days a week as the community manager, right? Like, I, I, I did what I needed to do. You can offer trade, you can help them with marketing. There's a lot of spaces that do, you know, depend on kind of like the member, you know, user uh, trade agreement. So get creative, you know, think outside the box. Stop though. Those all the good stuff that co-working can do for you. Now we're gonna get real. I have to do my due diligence. I have to respect my co-working people, right? Because sometimes digital nomads can get a little bit of a bad rap in the co-working world. I love all y'all. I don't know most of y'all, but I love all y'all. But there's some people that I've met in co-working spaces that they're giving digital nomads a bad rap, right? With, as with any community, you get what you put into it. Don't be that guy. <laughs> don't, please, I'm begging you, don't. Respect the space. First and foremost, dirty coffee mugs in the sink when there's an empty dishwasher. I don't know if you can read that, it's Liam Neeson. If you leave dishes in the sink but the dishwasher's empty, I will find you. Old Girl Scout motto, leave the place cleaner than you found it. Respect the space. Secondly, loud talking. Oh my God, did you know that there was a scientific study that's proved that it's more distracting to hear a one-sided conversation someone's having on the telephone than it is to, ha to hear a conversation with two people in, in the same room? If you have a phone call, don't be that loud person talking. I'm Italian, I talk with my hands and I talk loud. I'm go to the phone booths, right? Take advantage and respect the space. Third, offices and like um, conference rooms. Don't squat. Everyone knows who the squatter is, the people that are like, oh, I don't wanna pay for the conference room, so I'm just gonna sit here until someone kicks me out. That's disrespectful to that business. That business owner is trying to sell that room, right? Next, respect the community. The community was there before you arrived, and it will be there after you leave. Digital nomads are digital nomads because we bounce all over the place. I'm in two, three different co-working spaces a week, right? Be respectful of the community. Never underestimate the power of hello. Talk to people. Take your headphones off. When you go to get some coffee, your laptop that's sitting on the desk isn't gonna get stolen. Hang around, you know, oh, hey, what's going on? My name's Mike, I'm new in town. Don't be the guy or girl that's always networking. Never give a business card to someone unless they've asked for it. Don't be just going on and on and on. I'm, I'm guilty of this too. 
I get so focused on what I'm doing. Digital nomads, we have to be so focused on everything that we're doing because we're business owners. Sometimes we're not aware. We're just talking about, we're, not everyone cares, right? Never ever ask, so what do you do? I hate that question. Even not even co-working, just in life, please. At networking events, don't ask, what do you do? Ask, hey, how long have you been a member here? Get a dialogue, try another question. Or even better, and this is one that always Matthias, always, uh, Matthias from Banks, so always gets me to, uh, reminds me is important. I didn't bring my lunch. What's your favorite local spot? Do you want to grab a bite? Like, get to know people. It's not like you're trying to get them out for a date. Just be like, hey, listen, let's get some food. You're hungry, I'm hungry, we gotta eat. Remember, intention. Intention is really important in all things in life. Give to give. This is something I have a lot of heart. I have, I have, it's really hard. Talk less. Listen more. Also, listen to listen. Don't listen to respond. You want your fellow community members to feel like you actually give a shit what they're talking about. You, might, you never know what you might learn. Now, it's okay to ask for help. That's the benefit of co-working space. Oh, fuck, MailChimp. Oh, can't stand MailChimp. How does this work? How does this work? Someone will be like, oh, actually, I'm really good with MailChimp. You'd be amazed the free help that people are willing to give you if you're not that guy or that girl. So ask for help, but it's not okay to expect it for free. Last but not least, give it time. The, the co-working scene in Chiang Mai is very unlike any of the ones anywhere else I've been in the world. Because everyone here is in such a cafe work culture, they kind of treat the co-working spaces here like just other cafes. So people go in and maybe they, they don't jive or they don't connect with people, they're a little too quiet. Give it time. Not everyone is for every space and not every space is for everyone. Hopefully you've been to coworker.com first so you kind of have a better idea what space might be better for you. But then if you're not feeling it, talk to someone and be like, hey, do you know a, a space that's like different? Nothing wrong with this, but you know, maybe I'm looking for that. There's all tons of spaces out there. So give it some time. Just don't be a one and done person. Don't be that, don't, you know, give it, give it a shot. Next, last but last not least, never forget, keep calm and co-work. So, here's the plug. Coworkaholic, digital detox in Brazil. You want to be there. It's going to be fabulous. Enter to win. These are the three things you got to do before tonight at the party. Like Rosemary Dream on Facebook. That's the resort that will be hosting us. Follow me on Instagram and click interested on the Coworkaholic Facebook event page. It's easy to find, just search it. Now, you get five times the entries if you share that event page. So, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me and for indulging my crazy emotional neuroticness. And please, 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 don't think twice. Friends don't let friends work in cafes. Go to co-working spaces. Thank you. Uh, has anyone got any questions for Mike? Anybody? Oh, oh. oh okay. Hey, Mike, I'm interested, by the way, fabulous talk. That was really great. Obviously, everyone heard me laughing, I'm sure, so. Uh, what are your top three favorite co-working spaces? I know you've been to over like 700 of them, so I'm curious to see what your favorite ones are and why. Uh, okay, so my number one co-working, favorite co-working space is actually not a co-working space. It's the um, Brussels Airline, or Brussels Airways um, uh, flagship lounge at Brussels Airport. It is fucking unbelievable. They'll give you Microsoft Surface tablets, there's Skype booths that are sponsored by Skype, there's tons of people that are working there, so that's, a, I always throw that curveball, that's always my answer. Uh, my second favorite co-working space would have to be Bespoke in San Francisco. It's a 25,000 square foot space in the flagship Westfield Shopping Center. It is off the fucking hook. It's so great, because you're in a mall. So you can go shopping, you get some food, you can work, they got a bocce court. Bocce is my favorite sport. And number three, I would have to say is Cowork Vallarta 
Anyone been to Puerto Vallarta, Mexico? Yeah. So um, it's in this perfect little part of town. It's the Romantico zone. They just got 100 megabyte fiber internet. Uh, my family's had a condo there for quite some time, and the internet was always shit, and so I'd have to go to a Starbucks. Um, but the reason why I love it, great community, great community management, really fast internet, um, and it's in one of the most beautiful, you know, LGBT-friendly beach resorts in the world, um, resort towns in the world. So those are my top three. Great. Thanks, Mike. Uh, there was one more question over here somewhere. Last one. Who had the hand up? Oh, the same question. Okay, perfect. All right, that Thanks. was absolutely amazing, Mike. Give it up for Mike LaRosa. Fantastic. Sorry, I got full hands.